thank you everyone for joining us for our afternoon educational session. Um, today we have Caitlin Cutshaw from the Lawyers Committee for Better Housing. She is the Equal Justice Works Fellow there where she promotes housing and educational stability for negative, negatively affected, for those negatively affected by eviction. She was also a 2018 Pili intern at Lawyers Committee for Better Housing. So she has, all, she has been in all of your shoes. Um, and today she's here to give us an overview of Illinois' landlord and tenant law, share tips um, to help protect our rights and the rights of our clients, and give us an update on the impact of COVID-19 to our work. So thank you and welcome, Caitlin. Thank you so much, Brent, and hi to everyone. As Brent said, I'm Caitlin. You stole my introduction right out of my mouth. I was going to say uh, I was in your shoes. And, um, you know, Pilly, it, or was a Pilly intern for the organization I am now Equal Justice Works Fellow for. So um, it just goes to show that great things come from Pilly. Um, and at the end of the presentation, I will share my contact information. So if at any point you all have questions about Pilly or EJW in general, I'm happy to connect. Um, but with that, I will go ahead and share my screen. Apologies for any delay. Okay. There we go. How's that look? Good. Okay. And if there are any um, issues with uh, uh, volume or technical issues, please feel free to throw them in the chat or shout at me because uh, I'm happy to change those. And uh, just don't forget to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, and I welcome to our own Pilly interns from LCBH. Apologies in advance for some of the information that you've probably already been presented. Okay, great. So I'm going to start by just providing a really quick background on um, LCBH. So our organization, Lawyers Committee for Better Housing, um, is a nonprofit legal aid organization providing free legal services for Chicago's low income and working class renter families since 1980. And to give you a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today, uh, we'll first talk about the Chicago Residential Landlord and Tenant Ordinance, or RLTO, uh, and certain rights that tenants have under this and other laws. Uh, we'll next talk about the eviction process in greater detail. We'll spend some time talking about other areas of housing, it's kind of a general hodgepodge of different um, you know, state, federal, and local uh, issues related to housing. And then we'll end with um, talking about COVID-19 specific responses that affect landlords and tenants, such as eviction moratoriums and the CARES Act. So we like to share some important statistics and fast facts about landlord and tenant law throughout these presentations to help demonstrate just how important this work is. So one in eight renters have experienced a forced move in the last two years. 74% of low-income renters pay more than half of their income towards rent, uh, meaning they are cost burdened. And this helps demonstrate why low-income renters have been especially impacted by this crisis. And thousands of Illinois renters live in units that fail to meet the basic definition of a safe and healthy home. In light of the renewed movement to end systemic racism and policing and to end police brutality, I want to take a moment to note that housing work is racial justice work. Black Illinoisans disproportionately experience homelessness in this state. Uh, that's according to a report from Housing Action Illinois. Um, and also to read a quote from sociologist Matthew Desmond, if incarceration had, become, had come to define the lives of men from impoverished Black neighborhoods, Eviction was shaping the lives of women who are disproportionately affected by housing displacement. So these are the primary laws governing landlords and tenants broken up by jurisdiction. We'll cover some provisions of these in greater detail later in the presentation. Uh, the Eviction Act bolded at the top is the primary source of state law concerning tenants and eviction defense, while the, in Chicago, the primary source of law is the Residential Landlord and Tenant Ordinance, it's a mouthful, or RLTO, also in bold. So discussing the RLTO and tenants' rights in greater detail, um, and actually I'm going to pause really quickly here. Um, if at any point questions come up, feel free to shout them out 
unmute yourself, throw them in the chat. I'll try and keep an eye on it. Um, but I will give uh, multiple opportunities for questions throughout the presentation. So it's important to know with the RLTO that it applies only to certain rental units in, in the city of Chicago. So buildings that are six units or less and owner occupied are excluded from the RLTO. For example, let's say a tenant lives in a single family home that has been broken up into three units and the landlord lives in one of those units. Well, the RLTO would um, not apply to that building and the tenant would not be covered. There is an exception to this exception, which is section 160 of the RLTO, also known as the lockout provision, because it applies to all units in the city of Chicago. And we'll talk about lockouts in greater detail um, in just a moment. To highlight some information about leases and landlords' responsibilities, leases can be oral or written. Many of the tenants we work with have oral month-to-month -month agreements, which are very common in Chicago. There are certain things that cannot be contracted to in a lease agreement, such as agreements to pay attorney's fees in the event of a lawsuit arising out of the tenancy. Section 140 of the RLTO provides a full list of items that cannot be included in lease agreements. So if you're curious to know um, if there's something in your own lease agreement that might not be enforceable, I encourage you to check out Section 140 of the RLTO. Um, and quick note, those provisions though included, again, are not enforceable if a landlord does try to enforce them. Also important to know with leases is that one party cannot unilaterally change the terms of the agreement in the middle of the contract term. For example, landlords sometimes try to increase tenants' rates unlawfully. Let's say, excuse me, increase tenants' rents unlawfully. So let's say a tenant is on a month-to-month -month oral agreement and the landlord gave them a notice on May 31st that the rent would increase on June 1st. That would be unenforceable. The landlord must wait a full lease term before changing the terms of the agreement or increasing the rent in this case. So the earliest the rent increase could become effective would be July 1st. Some additional lease requirements are that a landlord must provide contact information to the tenant. The landlord must attach information about tenant's rights. Um, to a lease in Chicago, including a summary of the RLTO or a, the bed bug ordinance. And lastly, there is a slew of specific requirements in the ordinance about security deposits, which is why many landlords are now moving away from security deposits for fear of liability and are requiring move-in fees instead. So what if a landlord won't make repairs? Section 110 of the RLTO allows tenants to send what is called a 14-day letter to the landlord demanding that he or she make re necessary repairs within 14 days or the tenant will exercise certain rights they have under the ordinance. The tenant basically has three different options that they may exercise if the landlord does not respond. Option one is for minor defects, which is defined as repairs costing $500 or half the tenant's rent, whichever is greater. The tenant may make those repairs themselves and deduct that amount from their monthly rent. Option two, a tenant may withhold a reasonable amount of monthly rent. So this is a tricky option and we often advise tenants um, interested in exercising this option to speak with an attorney first before withholding rent. But basically the amount withheld is supposed to reasonably reflect the reduced value of the premises due to the landlord's failure to make repairs. And finally, option three, a tenant can break their lease. So this option should really only be used if a condition is so severe that it essentially renders the unit uninhabitable. Lastly, if a tenant notifies a landlord of suspected bed bugs in the unit, the landlord has specific obligations under the bed bug ordinance, um, including inspecting the unit and providing the tenant um, with treatment. So what if uh, a tenant has no essential services in their unit? A tenant may then exercise their rights under 110F of the RLTO. Uh, essential services include heat, running water, hot water, electricity, gas, or plumbing. And in this situation, a tenant may send a letter to the landlord demanding that the utility problem be immediately addressed, or they have two options under the RLTO. The first option is they can notify their landlord that if the problem isn't addressed in 24 hours, they are going to withhold rent. 
In addition, they can also retain, obtain other services, other electricity, hot water, what, it, what have you, um, and substitute housing or recover damages while the, while the problem persists. Uh, the second option that a tenant has is they can notify the landlord that if the problem is not remedied in 72 hours, the lease will terminate. For tenants who experience severe conditions issues like this, we often advise to call 311 City Services. Though it is not an immediate solution, it can um, start the process of getting an inspector out to their building and it will have um, a record of a report with the Department of Buildings. So to talk specifically now about unlawful entry, a landlord may only enter a tenant's unit for a legitimate purpose after giving two days notice and only during reasonable hours. In addition to terminating the lease or obtaining an injunctive relief, a tenant may pursue damages for violations of this provision. As mentioned earlier, the lockout provision of the RLTO covers all units in the city of Chicago, unlike other provisions of the RLTO, which only cover certain units. Under the lockout provision, a landlord may not knowingly oust or dispossess or threaten or attempt to oust or dispossess any tenant from a dwelling unit. So some actions that may be considered a lockout include changing the locks or removing doors, Shutting off utilities can be considered a constructive lockout. So for example, if a landlord intentionally shuts off the heat in the dead of winter, the unit becomes effectively uninhabitable. Landlords who violate this provision may be subject to fines or damages in court. Basically, a landlord cannot self-help. Only a sheriff can evict a tenant and only after an eviction order has been entered in court. So during the COVID-19 response portion of this presentation, we'll talk a little bit about how there have been some changes to that process. So under Chicago ordinance, there is a presumption of retaliation if a landlord takes adverse action against a tenant within one year of that tenant engaging in protected conduct. So some examples of ad adverse action on the part of the landlord can include raising the rent or filing an eviction case, Examples of protected conduct uh, on behalf of the tenant can include requesting that the landlord make repairs, calling 311, or reporting issues to the alderman. It's important to know that under the Chicago ordinance, the presumption of retaliation is rebuttable. So if a landlord can show that they were terminated in tenancy for a legitimate reason, they may be able to rebut that presumption. Under Illinois law, the retaliation claim or defense is a bit different. A landlord is prohibited from terminating a tenancy if a tenant complained to a government agency about building violations or the termination would be against public policy. So the example provided here is where a tenant may have obtained an order of protection against a member of the landlord's family. Um, and in that situation, terminating the tenancy would be retaliatory. Under Illinois state law, the tenant may assert retaliation as a defense to eviction only. So I'm gonna take a real quick pause here and um, pause for any questions. And if I can access my chat function, I will check that out as well. Okay, not seeing any questions. I'm going to move on. Okay, so Moving on to speak more specifically about the eviction process in detail. Actually, I did just see a question, so I'm gonna pause real quick. The question is, have you heard of a landlord asking for an additional security deposit at a lease renewal? I have not. That is an interesting situation. I would recommend for a situation like that, having a copy of the previous lease on hand um, and making sure to have record of the previous security deposit that was provided because that should continue to suffice for any renewals going forward. Awesome. So with eviction specifically, um, there are two statistics I wanna highlight here. Only about 11% of renters have legal representation in eviction court, while almost 80% of landlords have attorneys. So there's a huge imbalance of power in an already very confusing process for pro se litigants. So we sometimes call eviction court the Wild West 
um, because cases are called so quickly and the average length of an eviction trial is 104 seconds. Um, the statistic is old, it's from 2003, but I, I don't think much has changed. It still moves very quickly. And over 23,000 cases, eviction cases are filed in Illinois each year. So evictions in the state of your Illinois are mostly governed by the Illinois Eviction Act. Evictions are supposed to be summary statutory proceedings, so the Eviction Act is pretty bare bones. It does detail notice requirements, which is the first step in initiating an eviction action. Additionally, the Eviction Act describes court procedures for eviction cases such as jury trial demands. So Illinois is a home rule state, um, meaning that home rule municip municipalities like Chicago have flexibility to pass local ordinances within parameters set by the state legislature, which is why we think of the Eviction Act as the floor and local ordinance um, as the ceiling supplementing on top of the Eviction Act. So one of the most helpful bits of information that we can provide tenants is that the eviction process is actually multiple distinct steps. For example, I had a tenant who had received a five-day notice and thought that that meant that she had been evicted when in actuality she cured the notice by paying rent late and a case was never filed. So just receiving a notice is not, does not mean that a tenant is evicted. And in fact, each of these steps is distinct. So step one, in order to initiate an eviction case, a landlord must serve the tenant with a termination notice. There are different types of termination notices or reason why a landlord may want to terminate a tenancy. And we'll talk about those mo more <laughs> on the next slide. Step two, the landlord cannot take the next step of filing an eviction case until after the cure period or notice has expired. And then the landlord must serve the tenant with a summons, which tells the tenant when and where to appear for court. Step three, appearing in court. Most cases are resolved on the first time up. Our organization has produced some interesting data that shows about 60% of cases end with eviction orders entered on the first time up but where a tenant has a legal aid attorney representing them, that amount decreases to 22%. So having effective representation can be enormously important in this process. Step four, the court will then enter its final disposition, whether it's an eviction order, dismissal, or judgment in favor of the tenant, which is rare. Finally, step five involves the sheriff executing the eviction order entered in court. So there are some COVID-19 related changes to this process, but as I said, we'll get into those towards the end of the presentation. Could I ask a question really quickly? This For is, sure. Thank you. Um, this may be a silly question, but since I'm very new to all of this, um, I thought it might, it might not be as obvious as it seems to me. It seems like if the, if the lease, either oral or written, were to come to an end, then this, this doesn't apply, correct? Like this only applies if there's a valid lease in process or in the, during the, like in, uh, in progress? Is that, do I understand that correctly? No, that's a really good question. And um, there are no stupid questions. I can tell you that I'm still understanding <laughs> this process <laughs> on my own. Um, so not exactly. So if we have a tenant who has an oral month to month agreement and a tenant uh, landlord provides them with a 30 day notice that they are uh, required to vacate, if the tenant does not vacate, then the landlord will then go forward with filing an eviction case. Um, additionally, with a, say a tenant has a year lease in place, as you mentioned, doesn't there need to be a lease in place? If a tenant has a lease in place and that lease expires and they, what is called hold over, then the landlord is gonna go forward with filing a case. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter whether there is an oral or written lease in place. What matters is that there's a landlord-tenant relationship, and if the tenant is asked to vacate, whether lawfully or unlawfully, then the landlord does have to go through the eviction process. Did that help answer your question? Um, I guess I don't understand what that looks like on the ground level. So you're saying that if a landlord were to, like, so say, for example, there's a one-year lease, ends on, I don't know, like July 31st, okay. Mm -hmm. So then August 1st, the landlord shows up, the tenant won't vacate the premises, or the landlord shows up and the, the tenant says, well, I have some other right to be here or something, I don't know. 
um, then what, like, what rights do the landlord and tenant have in, in case of that? Like, assuming either that the lease was supposed to end on the 31st, say, for example, to make it simple. Yeah, no, in, in any uh, situation, especially in the one you just painted, there needs to be a notice provided before the landlord could go forward with an eviction process. So if, you know, in the position, in the example you provided, there was no notice provided, then the landlord would need to start there. Um, and then maybe, you know, the tenant would move or they want it and then they would file a case. So the notice um, would still need to be provided regardless yes. of whether the written lease was in place. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about notices and when those need to be provided on the next slide. And I'll give a specific example about somebody who might have a year long lease. Thanks. Sorry if that was silly, but I just didn't understand the process. No, no, not at all. And um, I'm getting better at explaining it. So, and it, it can be confusing. So thank you for, um, thank you for asking. Um, I also have another question in the chat that says, would written notice to vacate include a landlord texting a tenant? This is so funny because we've gotten this question multiple times when I've done this um, presentation. And I actually did have a client who received a text message image of their notice, which would be the first step in initiating an eviction case. And um, the judge did determine that because a tenant had received that, you know, you can show that a tenant has received a text message, receipt tends to be enough. So it shouldn't be valid under the Eviction Act. It's not a proper method of service and it's not really a proper notice on its face. But because the judges that we work with in eviction court aren't the most sympathetic to tenants, um, to answer your question, I think based on my experience, a, t a text would probably um, qualify as a written notice. Okay, I'm gonna move on. So to speak specifically about different types of notices and different types of reasons why a landlord might want to um, terminate a tenancy. The first one listed here is a five-day notice and a tenant would receive a five-day notice is if there's an issue of past due rent. So the notice gives them five, five days to cure, excuse me, and must include statutory language from the Illinois Eviction Act. And I'm not going to go through each of the requirements of these in specific, but just kind of touch on general, um, what each one is generally. Um, so with a 10-day notice, um, this is when a, a landlord would give a tenant a 10-day notice when they're alleging that they have breached some term of the lease. So a common example is that maybe a lease prohibits pets and a tenant has a pet in their unit and the landlord has discovered that information, they would then provide the tenant with a 10-day notice. 30-day um, notices, we often call these non-renewal or no-cause notices. So in Illinois, landlords may give tenants 30 days notice that their tenancy will terminate, but they must provide the notice um, at the end of the rental period. They cannot provide the notice in the middle of the rental period. So to um, kind of Kara's question and with a specific example where a tenant has a written year long lease, um, let's say it's six months in, a landlord couldn't provide that tenant with a 30 day notice, uh, no cause notice. Um, you know, if it's a non-renewal situation, they would need to provide that notice at least 30 days before the end of that year-long lease. Um, and they can't provide it more than 90 days. That's just another requirement under the R RLTO. Um, but with tenants who have month-to-month -month, um, agreements, it's a little bit different. So to provide a specific example, so let's say a tenant has a month-to-month -month agreement and let's assume that they pay rent on the first of the month. A landlord could not serve them with a 30-day notice on say June 15th and ask them to be out by July 15th. Um, they would have to wait till the end of the rental period. They would have to wait till the end of July to move forward with filing a case. Um, and then a 90-day notice um, is for tenants who are living in foreclosed properties. So there are all sorts of rights a tenant has under the Keep Chicago Renting Ordinance or KCRO if they're a bona fide renter living in a foreclosed property. So serving the termination notice, there are four methods specified under the Illinois Eviction Act as to how a landlord can serve a termination notice. They can serve it personally by handing it to the tenant um, in person. They can do it by substitute service, which is uh, giving the notice to someone who is 13 years or older who lives in the unit. And they can send it by certified mail. 
Uh, the last option, serving service by posting, this method is only available where no one is in actual possession of the unit. And posting means posting it on their door. So filing a case, a landlord may not file a case until after the notice or cure period has expired. Um, they can file a single action, which claims no money. They can file a joint action, which claims possession as well as uh, alleged back rent owed. Once a case is filed, this is important, it can remain on a tenant's background for years to come, regardless of the disposition in the case, um, and regardless of if there was any finding of wrongdoing on the tenant's, port, at tenant's part. Excuse me. Um, this is important because reporting tenant um, screening agencies and credit reporting agencies can have access to this information, so it can affect a tenant's ability to find housing in the future. I, for example, I had a client who, um, had an eviction case on their record 10 years back, and it is still affecting her ability to find housing today. Um, this is what an eviction complaint looks like. Just real quick to give you a little image of it. It's one page, pretty much, very simple. I also wanna give you a little glimpse of the Wild West of eviction court in this tiny picture here. So cases are assigned to five bench rooms. Um, we estimate that about 250 cases are heard between these rooms each day. So there's a lot of concern about court being reopened and about public health and safety. Um, most important on this slide is uh, the risk that a tenant may have an ex parte eviction order entered against them if they do not appear in court, ex parte meaning without one party being present. Our organization operates a help desk outside the eviction courtrooms and we've been in situations where we've been advising tenants of their rights, providing brief advice on the spot, and an ex parte eviction order was entered against them during, in a matter of seconds during that um, advice. So even if a tenant is in court, this risk can still, um, there can still be a risk of this happening. So what are the tenant's options on the first time up? Um, I just got a question about, is there a process to remove an eviction from your record? And I'm going to touch on that in a couple slides. Uh, but to talk about the tenant's options on the first time up, uh, they can request a one week continuance to seek legal representation. Um, judges do routinely grant this request. Um, however, it isn't codified anywhere, so it's not a tenant doesn't have a right to a continuance, but they may request it. Most often, if tenants appear, they can and will negotiate a settlement with the landlord or the landlord's attorney. Um, tenants also have a right to a jury trial in eviction court. This is provided for in the Illinois Eviction Act. And um, quick reminder that lease provisions that waive a tenant's right to a jury trial are unenforceable. And obviously, a tenant can go to trial on the first time up. So in eviction trial, tenants have rights to discovery, they have right to examine witnesses, and they have other rights to due process. Um, as we mentioned earlier, most cases are resolved through agreed orders. Uh, settlements usually involve one of two things. Uh, they'll either involve an agreed move out date, or they'll involve what we call pay and stay agreements, where a tenant will agree to pay a certain amount of back rent, allegedly owed, usually in installments, and then they will stay in the unit and continue to pay rent going forward. Um, so to address Andy's question in the chat, he's asking, is there a process to remove an eviction from your record? That is what we call sealing. Um, unfortunately, the way that the statute is written um, in the Illinois Eviction Act to seal a case, um, it's pretty difficult. The legal standard is, is difficult to meet. And our organization is actively working on passing legislation that would make it easier for tenants to seal an eviction case so that is not continually uh, affecting their ability to find housing down the road. Um, for tenants in foreclosed properties, uh, these ev eviction actions are sealed automatically. Um, but just to touch on the importance of this one more time, um, it can be hugely important for mobility and housing security to uh, not have that eviction showing up on a tenant's record. Oftentimes when a tenant does have that on the record, regardless of the outcome, as I said, they are forced to move to substandard housing, sometimes with poor conditions, and often are disqualified from public housing. So real quickly, I'm gonna 
touch on some kind of miscellaneous um, different areas of housing. I wanted to note the difference between subsidized and private housing. So some examples of subsidized housing include tenants with Section 8 housing choice vouchers um, or tenants living in, say, low-income housing tax credit buildings and, and various other um, subsidized programs. Um, it's especially important to know whether a tenant receives some sort of assistance because they could be entitled to additional protections right now under the CARES Act. And I'll talk specifically about the CARES Act in just a moment and how it affects subsidized tenants. Um, so most tenants will know if they have a subsidy, but it can also be determined that by looking at the amount in rent a tenant pays. So if they're paying below fair market rent, substantially below fair market rent, they may have a subsidy. Additionally, there's a really great tool. It's called the National Housing Preservation Database uh, that you can use to look up a property to see whether it is subsidized. And then most importantly, if a tenant is evicted from subsidized housing, they will likely lose their subsidy and become homeless. So to touch on fair housing, uh, when we talk about fair housing, we're referring to Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968 or the Fair Housing Act. The act prohibits discrimination in the sale, rental, and financing of dwellings and in other housing-related transactions based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, and disability. So some examples of F FHA violations include sexual harassment or refusing reasonable accommodations, which we'll talk about on the next slide. The FHA covers all properties regardless of ownership, though there are some exemptions, including religious organizations and private clubs. The FHA and definition of discrimination, I imagine, will be impacted uh, by the recent Supreme Court decision protecting LGBTQ workers from employment discrimination, which will be interesting to see how the law evolves in that way. Um, and if you're looking for more information on fair housing and related issues, I encourage you to look to the Illinois Department of Human Rights or the John Marshall Law School Fair Housing Clinic. Um, forewarning, I'm, I'm, this isn't my area of expertise, so if you have questions, definitely reach out to those resources. Reasonable accommodation. So under the FHA, a landlord must allow reasonable accommodation in rules, policies, practices, or services so a person with a disability can have full use and enjoyment of the housing. So a common example is when a tenant needs a support animal, but the lease prohibits pets. So a tenant in that situation could then submit a reasonable accommodation. When submitting such an accommodation, a tenant must explain their disability, uh, which is defined as a physical or mental impairment or record of such impairment, and how this impairment substantially limits one or more major life activities. Additionally, there must be a connection between the accommodation that's being uh, requested and um, the tenant's disability. So the Immigrant Tenant Protection Act was recently passed in 2019, and Illinois is only the second state after California, but the first in the Midwest to enact such legislation. So the act protects tenants from intimidation, harassment, retaliation, and eviction based on their actual or perceived immigration or citizenship status. So landlords may not disclose or threaten to disclose this information about a tenant's immigration or citizen citizenship status, excuse me, or evict a tenant based in whole or in part on that status. So I'm going to take uh, just a quick pause. If there are any questions related specifically to the other housing issues that we talked about. Okay, so to talk specifically about um, recent changes related to COVID-19. So on this slide you'll see a list of questions um, that are common concerns of tenants right now during this global health camp pandemic. I'm not going to go through every single one of them. There are 10 of them, as you can see, so don't worry. But I am going to highlight um, some of the more important questions. So skipping right to number two, if I can't pay, can I be evicted? So probably not in Illinois right now under Governor Pritzker's executive order 2020-30. Landlords are prohibited from filing most new eviction cases. 
So that order was issued on April 23rd and it extends for the duration of the disaster proclamation and we believe it's going to be extended through the end of July 31st. There are some exceptions to this order, for example, where the tenant poses a direct threat to the health and safety of other tenants. Um, whether a tenant can be evicted during COVID-19 is also going to depend on whether that tenant is protect protected under the CARES Act. So the CARES Act, and I, I'm blanking on the, the full name right now, um, but the CARES Act prohibits some landlords from issuing notices to vacate or filing eviction cases for non-payment of rent. And the act applies to properties with federally backed mortgages, so backed by FHA, Fannie Mae, or Freddie Mac, and their other, um, other programs, or buildings that benefit from federal subsidies. So that would include Section 8 Housing Choice voucher programs um, and other programs. So the CARES Act also prohibits landlords from charging late fees. Um, to tenants in, in protected buildings or with a protected subsidy. And uh, the CARES Act was effective March 27th and extends until July 25th. So after that point in time, the landlord must serve a 30-day notice uh, for issues of non-payment of rent. And then finally, still on question two, for pending eviction cases, um, as many of you may know, there's a current court closure and Chief Judge Evans General Administrative Order 2020-01 uh, states that no eviction orders can be entered or carried out by the sheriff until July 6. So number three, um, should I participate in a rent strike? There has been a lot of discussion nationwide about rent strikes in response to COVID-19. Our organization advises tenants that you know, this is a powerful tool to get your landlord to come to the negotiating table, especially if you're doing it in a group, in a tenants unit, union especially. Um, but we do want to make sure we advise them of the, the, the risks involved and make sure that they know that this is not a legally protected activity and that they could be exposing themselves to a possible eviction filing. Skipping to question five, can my landlord can show I me- Can ask another question? No, go for it. Uh, this is Cara again. I don't know what a rent strike is, so maybe that's my ignorance again. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's a tricky question. So there's been all sorts of, the terminology is apparently important. Um, strike versus cancellation versus suspension. Um, and I think there are more. Um, but a rent strike, my understanding is when um, usually it's a collective action, right, where a tenant or group of tenants um, inform their landlord that they're not going to be paying uh, rent. So that's my basic understanding. That's what I thought, but I wasn't sure. Okay, yeah, no, thanks for asking. Okay, moving on to number five, question number five. Can my landlord show my unit to prospective tenants? Uh, no. So the Illinois Department of Commerce has confirmed that landlords may not conduct in-person showings of occupied residential rental properties. Skipping to number seven, am I allowed to move during the stay-at-home order? Yes, Governor Pritzker's stay-at-home order does include moving services in the list of essential businesses, uh, but tenants should of course continue to observe social distancing and, and other take all necessary precautions. Number eight, can my landlord charge late fees or give me a five-day notice? Again, this is going to depend on whether a tenant is protected by the CARES Act. So if they are protected by the Act, then no, the landlord cannot charge them late fees and cannot give them a five-day notice. We are also, housing advocates in general are interpreting the Act to include all notices of termination. So although the Act says non-filing for, no, no filing non-payment cases, we are interpreting interpreting the language of the act to include that a landlord cannot uh, serve a tenant with any type of termination notice. Um, but for all other tenants, a landlord can charge late fees as long as they are not excessive under the RLTO. And then for tenants not protected under the CARES Act, they may still receive a five-day notice though the landlord is prohibited from filing or going forward with filing a case based on that notice until August, at, at least under Governor Pritzker's executive order, as long as they don't fall within one of the um, 
the exceptions that I listed earlier. And then number nine, can my landlord ask about my health status? So no, landlords are not entitled to information about a tenant's health status. And if they've been diagnosed with COVID-19, a landlord is not entitled to that information. Um, and a tenant is not required to disclose that information. However, um, some tenants may want to disclose that information to that landlord to uh, negotiate a better payment plan or resolution, whatever it may be. And the last question I'm going to highlight uh, here is what should I do if I'm locked out or worried about becoming locked out? So with eviction moratoriums and the other protections we've talked about in place, we worry about an increase in self-help evictions uh, where a, a landlord illegally locks out a tenant. And again, only the sheriff can execute an eviction order. Um, so if a tenant is in this situation, we advise them to call the police. Um, as difficult as that may be, especially in this current climate, but they are obligated to resolve lockout situations under a special order. It's called Special Order 9312. Um, and if a tenant is illegally locked out, they are um, obligated to restore the tenant to possession. So this is a slide that kind of breaks down the protection of their cares. Um, I did kind of talk about this already. So I'm not going to go through it again in detail. And then if you have additional questions about COVID-19 related housing issues, um, I encourage you to check out some of the resources on this page. Uh, so for federal uh, resources, there are uh, databases that have been put together to help tenants and housing advocates determine whether a property is covered under CARES. The one provided here was put together by Fannie Mae, I believe, um, but it only applies to multifamily units with uh, five plus units. Okay, thanks Zach for your question. I'm gonna um, share with the group. So Zach is asking if I can talk about alternative ways to address and document lockouts without calling the police. Um, that's a really good question. You know, usually we advise tenants who are afraid that they might be locked out to carry with them at all times some proof of residency or uh, evidence of their tenancy, which can include a lease, um, rent receipts, as long as they have, you know, the uh, address of their unit on it or um, some type of mail or, or utility payment, something like that. It could be helpful to have this on hand when dealing with a landlord who is threatening a lockout or goes forward with a lockout um, and something that they could do without calling the police. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of other ideas. That is a good question and something that we should certainly be as housing advocates thinking about right now, especially with communities that aren't going to be relying on the police for issues like this. I think also, you know, you can call certain housing advocates tenant hotlines, especially Carpels in Chicago is a really great one to call. I have heard that they've been a great resource for tenants who are experiencing lockout issues and um, can usually get connected pretty quickly with Carpels uh, hotline, hotline, excuse me. But thank you, Zach, for asking that question. <laughs> uh, and there was another question about the accessibility of the resources on this slide. I have included most of these through Google Docs or direct links to the website. For example, the Fannie Mae website should directly link to the website. I can share the slides with Brent after this um, presentation and maybe he can, he can kind of share them around, which would be great. But they, they should be access accessible, excuse me, and I will double check the sharing settings because I know that's always tricky. Um, but yeah, so, and then if you have additional questions about the CARES Act, if I kind of muddled through it today, I definitely encourage you to check out the National Housing Law Project um, link provided, or just Google it, because they have a great summary of the CARES Act that lists by bullet points all of the different subsidized programs that are covered. Um, yeah, and then we also have some Illinois, uh, Cook County, and Chicago specific resources. Two, the first two were produced by Lawyers Committee for Better Housing. Um, the Frequently Asked Questions is going to go through most of those 10 questions that we talked about on this slide. 
um, and just kind of walk through the, the responses. And then can I be evicted during COVID-19 is a flow chart that kind of walks tenants through, um, you know, whether they're going to be protected by these uh, various executive orders or, or federal protections. It does need to be updated. The, the dates are a little bit off, but hopefully we'll update that soon. And then, yeah, the rest are kind of uh, uh, those specific orders that I, that I touched on earlier. Um, so we're pretty good on timing. So I'm just going to do a really quick plug for other pro bono opportunities for Lawyers Committee for Better Housing. We have a virtual clinic called Rentervention, which is a really great opportunity to help tenants from home, especially given that most of us are working from home right now. So it's a really easy kind of fit into your own schedule way to um, provide some brief advice to tenants, um, use this information that you learned today uh, to get out there and help. Uh, the next one is the George Leland Legal Clinic. So this is actually my, as Brent mentioned, my Equal Justice Works uh, project. So we set up a, a legal clinic at the George Leland Elementary, which is located on the west side in the Austin neighborhood. And that was operational starting in March, uh, February. But as you can imagine, we've had to delay and um, put that off for now. But we are hopefully reworking that for next school year school year or later down the road and for the time being we've kind of turned it into a virtual opportunity but once that's up and running something also to keep in mind because we are um, always happy to have volunteers at the clinic and then finally the eviction brief advice desk i did mention earlier it is uh, located right outside the eviction courtrooms and it is a really awesome opportunity to provide uh, brief advice on the spot to a tenant moments before they step up for a case. Um, and that is virtual right now as well. Um, but if you want more information for, about that, you can, I can connect you with our other Equal Justice Works fellow, Carl Sessions, who is um, running that. And then here's my contact information. Um, if you have any questions about housing or just general career questions, EJW, Pilly, whatever it might be, I am happy to connect. And I'll stay on if there are any additional questions. Um, so Crystal is asking a question about whether issues of domestic violence may break a lease. So I'm going to point you to the Safe Homes Act which does provide uh, um, survivors of domestic violence with certain rights in a housing situation. Um, however, I <laughs> don't know the specifics off the top of my head right now. I didn't take a look at it before this presentation, but definitely check out the Safe, Home Act, Safe Homes Act as there might be some information in there. And, and actually, we, we have a presentation on um, domestic violence, I believe it's next week. Yes, next week, um, June 30th. So, so we can ask that question then too. Awesome. Okay, so I'm getting a question about, does the COVID order impact the answer about the 30-day eviction notice in any way other than regarding the two types of properties you listed on your slide. Um, so when you say COVID order, I'm guessing you're talking about CARES Act or about Illinois protections? CARES Act, okay, great. Um, yes, it does. So we've been interpreting, like I said, the CARES Act to apply to all different types of notices. So, for example, we've had situations where tenants are in federally backed properties or do have a covered subsidy that would be protected by the CARES and they've been given a 30-day notice by their landlord. And so what we've done in those situations is we've sent cease and desist letters or um, push back on those notices as unenforceable. Um, and then... Okay, so then I have another question about, are there any limitations on the fees a landlord can charge for buying out a lease agreement? Hmm. This sounds to me like a situation of where maybe a tenant is 
leaving their lease early. And usually in that situation, you wanna take a look at the lease and you wanna see if there's an early termination clause, because that might mean if there is, a, the tenant might be liable for the remaining amount of the rent um, for the remainder of the lease. Um, fees, I, I don't know about fees. There's the only limitation I know of is, is late fees. Um, so that sounds like something that maybe could be negotiated though. So yeah, if there are any additional questions, thank you, Brent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Caitlin. I thought that we, um, since we have a couple minutes at the end, will you talk a little bit about how you, um, well, it's a little bit of a preview for our um, like fellowship panel that we have in a couple weeks, but I like to, um, one of the questions that a lot of interns ask is how did you develop your Equal Justice Works Fellow program? Like how did you get the idea? Um, so maybe just with a couple minutes at the end, if you want to talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so I think a lot of credit goes to Julie Pouch, who was my supervisor while I was interning at Lawyers Committee for Better Housing as a PILI intern. Um, because, you know, towards the end of my, um, I see Zach smiling because I know he knows how great Julie is too. But towards the end of my internship, um, you know, sh she's kind of sat, I think most people down and is like, well, how do you want to continue your, your work through your PILI, uh, your PILI internship? What are you thinking for the future? Obviously, you know, always thinking about retention. And I was interested at Equal Justice Works at the time. So we together kind of talked through what is something that could fit into the structure of the organization, because obviously that's hugely important for viability and also making your application through Equal Justice Works just seem real you know, um, because if it's not going to fit within the host organization, then it's probably not going to be successful. Um, so yeah, and she, you know, helped me develop it also based on your own interests and um, experiences so, and background. So be, I came from a Teach for America background and had been in the classroom previously and obviously was interested in how housing intersects with, you know, issues related to access to education and, and um, you know, child development. So that's kind of how we came up with the school clinic idea.